And in this chapter, we have Christ transfigured in verses 1 to 13. And then he cast out a devil that his disciples could not cast out, verses 14 to 21. And then he speaks of his death and resurrection once again. He began to speak to his disciples about it in chapter 16. Now he brings it up again, verses 22 and 23. Uh, 23. And then he pays taxes. <laughs> That's what it means when it says uh, to pay tribute, basically talking about tax, verses uh, 24 to 27. So that's what's in Matthew 17. Like I said tonight, the plan is to look at the first 13 verses. And, uh, but let's back up to chapter 16, verse 27, because the last two verses in chapter 16 sets us up for what we're going to look at tonight in the beginning of uh, chapter 17. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. And then, now obviously the second coming of Christ to the earth, then he shall reward every man according to his works. There are different judgments to come. Our judgment as the body of Christ will have taken place before this. We're going to give an account of our service at the judgment seat of Christ when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air before the 70th week of Daniel. That seven years that's prophesied and determined upon Israel. He comes in the glory of his father with his angels at the end of the 70th week. And this is talking about a judgment regarding uh, Israel as far as those who are going to be rewarded and reign with him in his kingdom. We also know there's a judgment on the nations as in Matthew 25. Uh, the Bible speaks of a judgment on angels. The Bible speaks of his judgment of the lost, which is after the millennial reign. There's not one general judgment. Religion teaches that. The Bible does not. When you look at the time element, when you look at the people being judged, when you look at the criteria, when you look at the results, and you compare Scripture with Scripture, there are various judgments to come. So he said, Then shall, he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, he hasn't come in his kingdom yet. So how could this be true? How could um, he say, there are some of you standing right now with me, hearing me, you're not going to taste death until you see me coming in my kingdom. Well, how did that work? Well, the answer is in the next chapter. Let's read verses 1 to 13. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. That's the understatement of the year, I guess, all right? <laughs> what an experience this was. They see him in his kingdom glory. So that's the answer about verse 28 of chapter 16. That there were some, just like he said, who would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's what they see right here. They have a vision of Christ coming in his kingdom. And so this took place. That's how you answer the question about Matthew 16, 28. It's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Of course, Elias here is talking about Elijah. While he yet spake, so the Lord interrupted him. Uh, it says he didn't know what to say. Um, in Mark and Luke's account, it's made mention. He, well, not knowing what to say, maybe he should have said nothing. <laughs> He just has to speak up and say something, and he's not saying what he ought to say. I mean, when he said, it's good for us to be here, he could have left it there. But he's like, I, I have an idea. I'll take control of this situation. This is what we ought to do. Uh, God interrupts him. Verse 5, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. 
And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. In other words, shut up, Peter. <laughs> Hear ye Him. It's about Him right now. And when the disciples heard it, they danced for Jesus. Right? <laughs> no, they, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Boy, the, I don't want to run this rabbit. I'll just mention so many people today in the professing church, they have watered things down so much and have tried to humanize God. There's no real fear of God, it seems. They take God so lightly. He's still Almighty God. And when His voice spoke from heaven, it thundered, and they just fell on their face so afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, as He often did, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision of no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered, Son of them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. In other words, whatever they please, whatever they liked. Likewise also... Uh, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now, notice the time element in verse 1, after six days. Luke says it was about an eight days after these things. So let me ask you a question. What's after six days and about eight? I'd say seven. You, so it's the seventh day, that's the time element. On the seventh day, this takes place, this transfiguration. And uh, he was transfigured into his kingdom glory. Now we're going to look at this passage a little bit later, but uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 16, Peter refers to this, and he says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So in reference to this, he said, we were eyewitnesses of what? The power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So like Jesus said, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. That's what they saw. It's called a vision in the passage in verse 9, I think they were likely just transported out yonder in the future to see exactly what it's going to be like when Christ is in His kingdom glory. What an amazing thing. And so, a mountain, they're taken up on a high mountain apart. You know this. In the Bible, a mountain is a mountain, but it's also symbolic of what? A kingdom. Isaiah 2 talks about the Lord establishing His kingdom in the earth. And it says, that's just one that comes to mind. There are many I could show you. But in Isaiah 2, verse 2, it says, many people, excuse me, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the last days, the last days of prophecy, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. He's the king of kings, His kingdom over all shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So he's up on this high mountain with Peter, James, and John. They see him in his kingdom glory, and it's on the seventh day. I think it's very likely that the millennial reign of Christ will be the seventh millennium of human history. And so we know that God did his work in six days in Genesis 1. And on the seventh, he rested. And we know that it's, uh, the millennial reign is called a rest and a refreshing. And it's interesting in Genesis 1, when you go through the six days, it says the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, so on. 
But when you get to that seventh day in Genesis 2, it says, verse 3, um, well, verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. He did not command man at this point to keep a Sabbath. That was given to Israel later. It's just that God stopped from his work, and it was a special day. But notice it doesn't say the evening and the morning were the seventh day. Because of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Yes, there's a thousand years because it marks off a final battle with Satan, and then his kingdom continues on. After the renovation of the heavens and earth with fire, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, but the kingdom continues on. And so I think there's something to this. 2 Peter 3, 8 says that with the Lord, a thousand years is just one day. And one day is a thousand years. And there's a pattern there uh, from Adam to Christ, 4,000 years, four days. From Christ until he sets up his kingdom, first coming to second coming, you would think two days, that's about where we're at. There's a thousand years left. That's the millennial reign. We know that the rapture by which God's going to conclude this mystery age, the mystery of our rapture will occur at least seven years before the millennial reign. So that means the Lord's coming in about a few seconds here. <laughs> hey, we don't, God's not going by our calendar. There is a discrepancy, I guarantee you, between the calendars we keep and the one God is. So nobody's going to have it all pinpointed and figured out. But you can kind of get an idea, hey, there's about six, there's going to be 6,000 years of human history, and then the seventh millennium is going to be the millennial reign of Christ. That makes sense. Uh, but there's no sense trying to figure out a date and try to get it. Because we, again, there's, there's, it's very complicated. It's kind of like a template, a, a general thing, but you can't be too exact. God wouldn't let it be that way. But I don't know. I mean, look in, uh, well, you don't have to look. I'll read it to you. Hosea 6. Um, well, at the end of Hosea 5, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face and their affliction they will seek me early. Chapter 6, verse 1, Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. We shall live in his sight. Israel, raised, resurrected, saved as a nation after two days. In the third day. The third day. In other words, he set them aside. It's kind of the implication. Look, the mystery of this age was not revealed in the Old Testament but now that we have the mystery, we can look back at a passage like that and say it's kind of implied that God was going to uh, set them aside for about 2,000 years and then raise them up in the third. They all kind of fits. Now, I'm not, you, I, look, there are people that get carried away with trying to pinpoint things that you can't pinpoint. Now, here's the right way to look at it. You know when you should be expecting the rapture? Every day looking for that blessed hope. I believe it's imminent. And I know there's a lot of people, even pre-trib preachers, who don't think it's imminent. But Paul said, the Lord is at hand, as in our rapture. That means it's imminent. <laughs> the second coming is not imminent. Because certain things have to happen first. Seven years have to be fulfilled. Signs have to be fulfilled. But there's no signs for our rapture. So we should look for it every single day. Excuse me. There's a whiteboard behind me here. We should look for it every day. That's the right attitude. Okay, now, back here to Matthew 17, uh, mountains, to, taking them up to a high mountain. I, I, I mentioned this, I think, in our introduction to Matthew, but Matthew's all about the kingdom of heaven. And all through Matthew, there's some notable mountains. And uh, again, the mountain symbolizing the kingdom. You have the sermon on the what? <laughs> on the mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, basically the charter of his kingdom, um, the law of his kingdom. You have the, this Mount of Transfiguration now here in Matthew 17. You're going to have the Olivet Discourse where Christ gives prophecy of the 70th week 
and His second coming. He does that from a mount. And then you have Mount Calvary in chapter 27. He dies on Golgotha, on that hill. And then the kingdom commission is given from a mount in Matthew 28. Very significant. So it says he was transfigured. Transfigured is to be changed in form. Now, the Lord went from glory to humility, but he's going back to glory. <laughs> Hey, he, the days of his humiliation were temporary. Um, hold a marker here. Let's run some references on this. Look in Isaiah chapter 53. While you're finding that, I'll remind you of what should be a well-known passage in Philippians 2, where Paul said, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Think of that. He's God. He's in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God because He's one with the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit, but made Himself of no reputation and took upon Him what? The form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself. He chose this and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Not just any death, even the death of the cross. But that's not where it ends. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. From glory... To suffering, back to glory. Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he shall grow up, the Lord Jesus, before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Talking about his humanity. He hath no form, nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He didn't look like a regular Jewish man. He was a servant. No form, nor comeliness. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected. Him. So in other words, he wasn't walking around with a halo, right? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now he came as a servant, and what happened to him in his ministry when he went to the cross, Isaiah 52, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled to be very high. There's coming glory, but first there was suffering, as many were astonished at thee. That's a good King James word. Somebody said, that's archaic. No, it's not. I just used it. You know what archaic means? It's out of use. If you read your Bible every day, there are no archaic words in the King James Bible. You're using them. <laughs> Astonied. That's more than astonished. That's when you're, so, I mean, you, you're sitting there like a stone. <laughs> as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. He had the form of God. He took on the form of a servant and he took that body all the way to the cross and was marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. But that's not where it ends because he rises and he ascends and he's glorified. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him because of his glory and his power. For that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now, look in Isaiah 6. Back to your left to Isaiah 6. The prophet Isaiah got to see what Peter, James, and John saw. Isaiah chapter 6, 
Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, he's the real king, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twenty covered his face, with twenty covered his feet, with twenty did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 Father, Son, Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth, see that, is full of his glory. He's seeing Christ in his kingdom glory on the earth. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And when you really see the holiness of God, you realize how unholy you are. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw him in his kingdom glory. There's like Peter, James, and John. Um, I'm not going to run all these references, but you know Malachi 4 talks about the son of righteousness rising with healings in his wing, the brightness of his glory. It said his face, Peter, James, and John, they saw his face as the sun in his raiment white as light. Well, you, you get a real good description in Revelation 1, right before the Lord is about to come back in judgment. John is transported out to the future, to the day of the Lord. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Revelation 1.10, the Spirit took him out to the future day of the Lord. And he sees, the, the, book, the book is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, so it makes sense the opening vision is Jesus Christ who's about to come. And in the midst, verse 13, of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. See, just like Jesus said, the Son of Man coming in His power and glory. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in, he had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You, you see, what did Isaiah do? What did Peter, James, and John do? What did John do here in this passage? The fear of God. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. <laughs> and have the keys of hell and of death. So this is what they get a glimpse of. And we can't even begin to fathom. You know, Paul talked about how he dwells in the light which no man can approach unto. When you say his face is like the sun, that's not like, well, that's kind of bright there. Go out there tomorrow when the sun's up, if it is, <laughs> and stare at that thing. See if you can, you can't take that. The power of his glory. Well, I know it's going to light up the whole new Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about the power of his glory. And so they get a glimpse of this on this mount. Amazing. We can't even begin to fathom it. But here's Peter, James, and John. People call them the inner circle. You say, why did God choose to take them three? Because God chose to do it. Well, he's not fair. Why did he choose the 12 that he chose? Because he chose the 12 that he chose. And out of the 12, he chose three to be privileged to some things that even the others didn't get to see. When, they, when Jesus raised that ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, his daughter from the dead, it was Peter, James, and John he took to see that. When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he went to pray. It, he took who? Peter, James, and John. Here it's Peter, James, and John. It's like the inner circle, so to speak. He gives them some things he doesn't give the others, and that's God's prerogative, you know. And 
There's kind of a, I'm not going to stop and deal with this, but there's something interesting there. You know, he had the 70 that he sent out, but then there was 12. And of the 12, there was three. And of the three, there was Peter, who was seemingly the leader. John, though, was the beloved disciple, and he had a, a very close relationship uh, and trust with the Lord. And it's just interesting to me. But uh, this inner circle... Um, Christ had just begun. Remember now back in chapter 16, he had just begun to speak to them about his suffering. I mean, for the first time, he begins to speak to them about how he's going to die and be buried and raised from the dead. And, of course, they don't get it. It's hid from them. They don't understand it. Peter's saying, not so. So what is he doing here? I'm going to suffer, but I'm going to be glorified. I'm confirming I'm going to set up my kingdom. The fact that I'm about to die is not going to stop me from setting up my kingdom. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And uh, so he's trying to confirm to them that it's still coming. And again, in this context, there's nothing about, okay, I'm going to set Israel aside and now build the body of Christ. When he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, he's talking about the church prophesied in the Old Testament concerning the kingdom. He's still confirming the kingdom. At this point, he's not revealing anything about the body of Christ. That comes later through the Apostle Paul. Now, why Moses and Elijah? Well, I could think of various reasons. Of course, they represent the whole Old Testament, really. I mean, the law and the prophets. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets. Do you know in Malachi, at the end of the Old Testament, the last two people mentioned at the end of the Old Testament is Moses and Elijah? And you get to studying Moses and Elijah. I mean, there's a lot of similarities. They both spent 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai. They both preached to types of the Antichrist. Uh, they both called down plagues. <laughs> I mean... There's a lot of things. I'm not going to go down the list, but there's similarities. And I think that they will be the two witnesses in Revelation 11, in the 70th week of Daniel. Um, some people say it's Elijah and Enoch because Enoch didn't die, Elijah didn't die, and it's appointed unto men once to die. Well, that's a general statement. Some people died more than once, like Lazarus. <laughs> There's a whole slew of us aren't going to die even once. <laughs> okay, so think about it that way. I, I think that's a weak, I, I, that's a common thing that's been said, but when you really analyze it, it's not, there's much more strength behind the argument of being Moses and Elijah. Now, I'm not even going to, look, <laughs> you're talking about Moses, he died, God buried him, and Satan, Satan wanted the body of Moses, and Michael fought with him about it. Michael said, the Lord rebuked thee, and he said, what does all that mean? Save it for another day. But it's interesting. And uh, Elijah, somebody said he went up in a chariot of fire. Actually, chariot of fire comes through. Then he goes up in a whirlwind up into heaven. Did he die later? Now, what happened to Elijah? God doesn't give us a lot of information there. I, I, I'm still studying on that. I, it's interesting. I don't have time to stop and deal with that. But um, it's interesting here that Peter recognized him. He never... He didn't see him on Facebook before, you know. I mean, he's, he, he, he's watching Jesus Christ. He gets transfigured, and then there's, he said, hey, there's Moses and Elijah. Now, to me, that's kind of a passage you can use when people have the question, will we know each other in eternity? Will we know each other in heaven, this type of thing? We won't really know each other until then. And you really think when we get to heaven, we're going to have less knowledge? <laughs> No, we, it's, uh, we're going to recognize. I, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna know who Paul is, and I'm going to bother him for about several million years. Paul, what about this? Paul, what? Now, of course, I'll, I'll know a lot more. I won't have as many questions. I, I, you get my point, though. I, I'm looking forward to talking to Brother Paul. Aren't you? You really think that's going to happen? It is. This isn't fairy tale stuff. I'm telling you the truth. That we're going to be with the Lord, but we're going to be with these saints of old. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to knowing these servants of God that 
the Lord has used. And what a wonderful thing to think about. But anyway, my, my saved loved ones that are already in heaven, I believe when I get there, I'll know who they are. I believe that. So I don't believe that. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> I believe that. I believe I have scriptural reasons for believing that. Now, um, it said they were talking. Moses and Elijah stand there talking to the Lord. What are they talking about? Well, we get a hint in Luke, uh, the parallel passage in Luke 9, verse 31. Um, it says, verse 30, Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, Elias, who appeared in glory. I mean, they were. It, it's Christ and his kingdom glory. But they're also powerful beings, you know. It's not like Moses is there leaning on a staff, you know, and he looks like a 120-year-old man. Because, by the way, even when Moses died at 120, his, his, his strength wasn't abated. Isn't that interesting? You know why he died? God told him to. <laughs> it, was the, it was the appointed time for him to go. <laughs> anyway, Moses, by the way, what a character. The meekest man on the earth. Isn't that inspiration proof right there that Moses wrote that? Moses wrote, I'm the meekest man on the earth. And he blushed when he wrote it. <laughs> well, he didn't write it of his own mind. God inspired him to write it. But you know about that meek man? I read over there just the other night. In my evening readings, I've been in Exodus. And here's Moses, the meekest man on the earth, breaking the tables of stone, taking that golden calf, grinding it to powder, putting it in the water, and making those jokers drink it. Saying, here's a line, who's on the Lord's side? You don't come on this side, he sent the men to go kill him. <laughs> Meekest man on the earth. The point is, meekness is not weakness. Jesus was meek. He wasn't what you see portrayed in these pictures and movies. Some long-haired, hippie-looking, effeminate guy. Not at all. Meekness is not weakness. Okay. You say, how do you know Jesus didn't have long hair? Well, I don't know. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. God wrote that. Pretty sure he wouldn't contradict himself. All right. All right. Y'all okay? You're looking at me like I'm... You with me? I'm running too many rabbits. Let's get back to the point. So, Luke 9, verse number 31 who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. He's going to accomplish this. He came to do it. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Hey, Jesus, when he died, he gave up the ghost. No, he laid down his life. He was the victor on the cross, not the victim. He accomplished this thing. He came to accomplish this. And they're talking about that death. So Peter speaks up. <laughs> I mean, here's the Lord in glory, Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about how he's going to die. Peter said, hey, it's good to be here, fellas. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I'm kind of known to sometimes say things I ought not, so I kind of relate to old Peter. And uh, Peter said, hey, it's good to be here, and... <laughs> And why don't we make three tabernacles? Now look, they're talking about the, his decease that must be accomplished. What does Peter want to do? Uh, I'm not, we're not going back down. Let's just go ahead and camp out here. <laughs> we're up here on the mountaintop in glory. We're not going back down there. You said you're about to die down there. It ain't going to happen. Let's make tabernacles. Why did he say tabernacles? Because of the Feast of Tabernacles, don't you reckon? All those feast days of the Lord are prophetic pictures. But guess what, guess what has to be fulfilled before tabernacles? Tabernacles is the millennial reign. And I'm not going to get into why the tabernacles and all the verses on that, but you can study that out. But guess, what's, guess what has to be fulfilled before tabernacles? Passover. The Lamb of God. It's got to go to that cross and fulfill that. And so he's saying, hey, well, let's just stay up here. Let's not worry about that suffering part. He still didn't get that, of course. Now, I don't know if the father is kind of, you know, he said, 
Let's make three tabernacles. Let's make one for Christ and then one for Moses. And what? Wait a minute. What are you doing putting Christ in the same category with Moses and Elijah? As great as they were, there is no comparison with the Son of God. So God interrupts them, saying, Hey, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. It's all about Him. Now, God spoke from heaven three times during the earthly ministry of Christ. Remember at His baptism in Matthew 3, 17, Christ is being baptized, the Father speaks from heaven, the Spirit descends, anoints Him for His ministry, and He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And He said that before the temptation in the wilderness, which proves God knew He wasn't going to sin. So that's a pointless question to keep bringing up like people do about the temptation of Christ. Could he have? There was nothing in him to respond. God cannot sin. He said, well, in his humanity, well, okay, look, if there was any chance, you reckon the Father would say before he's tempted, I'm well pleased. I already know how he's, I already know he's going to pass the test. You say, why was he tempted then? To show he is the Son of God. Not to see if he could sin, but to show he would not sin. So, the Father speaks. And by the way, <clears throat> there's, to me, it's just an illustration of the days we live in where people are so ignorant of the Word of God. You've got people that are supposedly Bible teachers fighting over the doctrine of the Trinity. And, the, and there are those who call themselves King James Bible believers and fundamentalists, and yet they want to say that there's actually not three persons in the Godhead. That's, that is basic Bible doctrine. If you, and if you can't get that, now I'm not saying I comprehend it, but I know the Bible said these three are one. That's the Godhead, which that word appears just, you know, three times that so, so happens. Godhead. You say, we call it Trinity, and I like the word because there's three in one. They can't use that. The Catholics use that. Well, the Catholics say that Jesus was born of a virgin. Does that mean he wasn't? Because, because they say he was? What matters is what does the Bible say? Trinity is not a Bible word, but it's a Bible doctrine. Now, if they're not three distinct persons, how do you have Jesus being baptized, the Father speaking from heaven, and the Spirit descending at the same time? They're three separate, distinct, yet they're one. One God. And so, another passage is in John 12. And I won't turn over there for time, but in John 12, you want to mark that down, uh, the Father speaks. And um, it says it thundered. I mean, I can't even fathom what the voice of God sounds like. But John 12, you can look at about verse 23 to 30 concerning that other time. So three occasions. But he, look, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, the father said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Now, here we are at the end. Guess what he said? I'm still pleased. Now, you look at me for three and a half years and know everything I say and do and don't do, and you follow my ministry for three and a half years and see if you can find fault. I'll go ahead and help you. You will. <laughs> okay. But the son of God is sinless. And after three and a half years of ministry, the father said, hey, just like I said before, I'm well pleased. And, and by the way, just a little side note, how wonderful it is to be accepted in the beloved. This is my beloved. God could never look at David Osteen and say, I'm well pleased. And don't get cocky because he can't do that for you either. Because in the flesh dwells no good thing, and the flesh profiteth nothing. But if you're in Christ, that's why God accepts you, because of Christ. Not because of you. Now, notice here it says in Matthew 17, um, verse 8, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now that's the way it's supposed to be. And you know what? When the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom, guess who's going to get the glory? Jesus only. In Isaiah chapter 2, prophesying of the Lord setting up his kingdom. It says in verse number 
10, enter in the rock, hide thee in the dust, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And then down again in verse 17, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go in the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. It's not baby Jesus anymore. That's what the world, they don't mind that, you know, around Christmas. Oh, baby Jesus, you know. Well, he grew up. And he went to the cross, and he died for the sins of the world. And he rose again, and he ascended up on high, and he's coming again. Get the whole story. And he's glorified. He's exalted. And he's coming to take over. It's going to be Jesus only. Why did he say, tell the vision of no man till the Son of Man be risen again from the dead? Well, again, only Peter, James, and John were privileged to have this vision before the cross. Besides, Christ is being rejected and everything is headed toward the cross. Now's not the time to preach such a thing. He's doing this for them and trying to prepare them as leaders. And they won't get it really until after the resurrection when their understanding is really open to see the relation between the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Let's quickly go to 2 Peter um, chapter 1. I referred to this earlier, but I want to read these verses because I want to make this point. You talk about an experience to be on the Mount of Transfiguration, to see Jesus in His kingdom glory, to hear the Father speak from heaven. You say, hey, that's not fair. I didn't get to... This, to, to uh, see something like that or hear something like that, but we, hey, we got something better. Look what Peter said, 2 Peter 1, 16. Peter said, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming for Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with them in the holy mount. We have also, I love this verse, I love it, I love it, a more sure word of prophecy. Now that's coming from a man who saw this and heard this. And he said, hey, we got something even more sure than that experience. We got the word of God. Where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have the word of God, and you know what? If you have a vision, it might be a counterfeit. You might be deceived. It might be Satan appearing as an angel of light. But you got the Word of God here, a written book that you can analyze and test. And I realize there are counterfeit Bibles out there, but you can see they're counterfeit because you got the real one. You could test this thing. And I can get it. Look, and if you have a vision, that's going to last just a little while, isn't it? But I could spend as much time in this as I want. Now, you know what we got today? We got a bunch of babies that would much rather, much rather have some feeling and experience than study the Bible. But feelings and experiences can be deceiving, and they're very temporary. But you've got an eternal book. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. We ought to spend a whole lot more time in this more sure word. What a blessing to have the word of God. Now, lastly, look in, look in um, Matthew 11. We'll finish this up tonight. The Lord said... All right? They asked him, you know, why do the scribes say Elias must first come? Now they base that on Malachi 4, verses 4 to 6. That's how the Old Testament concludes. And look, I know that there was no New Testament till the blood of Christ was shed on the cross, but in Matthew 1, guess where everything's headed? 
So the, everything's headed toward the New Testament. That's why it's okay. And I know some people, they nitpick, and they say, oh, you don't even know that Matthew 1 is still Old Testament? I don't care. what you Look, I call it the New Testament. I have no problem with that. I know where the New Testament starts, but I also know that Matthew is, chapter 1 is headed right toward that. So it's okay. It'll be all right. You know, there, some people, man, they make a, a mountain out of things, and they want to just act like they're so much smarter than everybody else. Anyway, anyway, Malachi, which I'm going to say is at the end of the Old Testament, <laughs> in our King James Bible, it ends, and you know, I ought to be able to find this since it's right close to where I'm already at in Matthew. Malachi 4, verse 5, Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And I think it's fitting the Old Testament ends with what word? Curse. Very fitting. All right, Luke chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but Luke chapter 1, many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Talking about John the Baptist. Zacharias, or excuse me, the angel said to Zacharias concerning John, uh, who he was going to be. It says, verse 17, He shall go before him and the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he go, John the Baptist comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, in Matthew 11, remember we already looked at this, so I'm just going to remind you. In Matthew 11, verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me, thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violent and the, uh, violence, and the violent taketh by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So in other words, if Israel had repented, then John the Baptist would have fulfilled the prophecy about Elijah. He had already come. Jesus said, he's already been here, and they killed him. Now they're about to kill me. They haven't repented. God had it fixed so it could go either way. And just like in early Acts, God knew. Look, God knew they were going to reject Christ, and he also knew they were going to reject the witness of the Holy Ghost in early Acts. God had all that figured out. But things are being revealed progressively. So everything had to be set up. So the point is, the kingdom was literally preached in the earthly ministry of Christ. And had Israel repented, then John the Baptist would have fulfilled that prophecy. But of course, we know that Christ had to go to the cross. God had all that figured out. It had to work out that way. The Bible's a progressive revelation. Okay, but Elijah... That's why I know for sure he's one of the two witnesses because he's got to come before the day of the Lord and he's going to have a ministry again in the great tribulation. It'll be Moses and Elijah, I believe. Now, the day of the Lord is the second coming, but if you look at all the prophecies on the day of the Lord, it, it includes what leads right up to it, the 70th week of Daniel. It includes what follows from it, the millennial reign. Specifically, though, in particular, it's the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom. So, he's telling them, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise, and I will come in my kingdom. Nothing's going to stop. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you, Father, for the time to study.